Um, so welcome everyone. Uh, today we'll have uh, Raphael talking about persistence default whitening classes. You can start whenever you want. Thank you, Adeli. Um, thanks everyone for being here. Um, so I'm very glad to present this work. Um, so it's about Stiefel Whitney classes and we'll start um, with persistent homology. Can you see if I uh, move my mouse on the screen? Yeah, yeah. thanks. All right, so I, um, I like to introduce persistent homology like that. Uh, so you are doing a scientific experiment and you obtain a point cloud, um, X here, and you suppose that this point cloud um, lies close to some submanifold, M here, the star color, and um, your goal is to estimate the homology of M from uh, simply X. So you all know the story, you build a filtration over X, uh, the check filtration here. Um, you consider the corresponding persistence module of, uh, in, in homology, and you compute the barcode. Um, so this barcode uh, contains uh, homological information about uh, the circle M, and I'd like to ask this question for the introduction. Uh, how can we actually uh, read the homology of M uh, in this barcode? So there is uh, two point of views that we can uh, adopt. A homotopy type estimation point of view or um, a stability point of view. So let's start with the first one. Um, in this talk, we'll only consider uh, check filtrations, uh, thickening filtrations. So the T thickening of X will be denoted uh, X to the T. Uh, you can see four thickenings here, and, and two of them are circles, uh, topologically. And we have theorems about that. Um, for instance, this one. So if the reach of M is positive, and if the Hausdorff distance between X and M is small enough, uh, there exists a whole interval where we can select uh, values of T, uh, such that the T thickening of X and M uh, share the same homotopy type. Um, this is another version of this uh, theorem. Um, the consequence is that on your barcode, uh, you have a whole window uh, where you see, uh, you can read the homology of the circle, the underlying manifold. Um, now the stability point of view. Um, so it is based on um, <clears throat> uh, the check filtration uh, on the unknown uh, submanifold M. So consider the check filtration of M. Um, what we know is that uh, the thickenings of M uh, have the homotopy type of M as long as uh, T is lower than the reach of M. So if you consider just the check filtration of M, you obtain a barcode like that. Um, and then you can apply stability. So let epsilon denote the Hausdorff distance between X and M. Uh, we know that by the stability of the check filtrations um, and the corresponding persistence modules, that the barcode of X is epsilon close to the barcode of M in a bottleneck distance. Um, so that does not give you um, a way to read the homology of M at some point. But what, what you know is that the large bars uh, in the barcode of M uh, remain large bars in the barcode of X. And the strategy here is to uh, uh, select the large bars. Um, okay, so this is it for precise homology. Um, however, um, in some contexts, uh, homology is not something uh, rich enough to uh, uh, study problems. So here um, I took the example of the torus and the claim bottle. Over um, Z2, the homology groups of the torus and the claim bottle are the same. You cannot uh, differentiate them with uh, homology. Uh, but there is in algebraic topology uh, a lot of uh, other invariants we can use. For instance, um, the homology groups over ZP. Uh, so in the case of the torus and the clean bottle, they are different. We also have um, the homology group over Z. So this is very powerful, but a bit of a nightmare uh, from a persistent point of view, uh, because uh, we do not have a nice list of indecomposable, though we can compute it. Um, we also have the cohomology algebra, cohomology ring, 
so there is a few work in, in that direction, in, in persistent uh, theory. But what we'll study today are the stiefel whitney classes. So here I um, took the first stiefel whitney class of the tangent bundle uh, of these two uh, surfaces. And as you can see, they are different. Um, so that's, this is what we'll um, uh, study today. We would like to uh, estimate these uh, stiefel whitney classes from uh, a point cloud observation. Okay. So uh, this will be the first uh, mission for me to introduce uh, nicely the stiefel whitney classes. Then we'll try to um, adopt a persistent point of view on it. And I um, end the talk with um, a discussion about um, algorithms. So if we um, want to talk about uh, stiefel whitney classes, we have to talk about vector bundles. On this slide, I give you the um, um, usual definition of a vector bundle. So a vector bundle of dimension d over x, x is any topological space. Um, so it is a surjection from e to x. e is a, a topological space. That satisfies two conditions. Uh, first, the fibers. Uh, have to be endowed with a vector bundle structure. You have to give the fibers a vector bundle structure of dimension, of dimension D, so they are uh, isomorphic to RD. And pi, the surjection, has to satisfy a local triality condition that is written here. Um, so basically, it means that locally, um, your uh, E, the total space, looks like the product of the base space, X, and uh, the vector space. Um, so in a picture, it means that uh, on top of each point of your um, uh, base space X, you put a vector space. So I give two examples here. Uh, over the circle, you have the normal bundle. You just put the normal space of the circle uh, at each point. Um, we also have the Mobius strip. Um, so this is also a very interesting uh, bundle. Uh, so as you can see, uh, the normal bundle, um, these lines, winds, uh, they do a full twist when you go around the circle, while for the modus strip, they do a half a twist. Um, for other examples, uh, this is the tangent bundle of the sphere. So for any manifold, you can define a tangent bundle. You just put the tangent space on top of each point of the manifold. And if your manifold is immersed, you have the normal bundle, for instance. And now we can define a uh, Stiefel Whitney classes. So I propose here the axiomatic definition. Uh, so it goes like that. If you have a vector bundle over X, so this is a subjection from E to X, uh, there exists a sequence of classes that are called the uh, Stiefel Whitney classes associated to your vector bundle. Um, and they satisfy some axioms. So you have. Um, uh, w0 of pi, the zeroth uh, Stiefel Whitney class. This is an element of uh, H0, the zeroth uh, cohomology group of X over Z2. Um, so everything uh, here will be over uh, Z2. Uh, w1 is an element of the first cohomology group of X and so on. Um, so this is a definition. Um, and uh, if you um, ask for these classes to satisfy this axiom here, then they are unique uh, and they exist, as we'll see in a few slides. Um, so let me read the first axiom. Uh, W0 of pi is one, the unit of the zeroth cohomology group. So this is not very interesting. Um, and if you have a vector bundle of dimension d, then Wi of pi is zero for every i greater than d. So the Stiefel Whitney classes uh, stop at the dimension of your vector model. Um, I, I recall that the dimension is the dimension of the fibers, the vector species. Um, okay. Um, I won't go through the other axioms, but only from them you can infer some uh, properties. So for instance, um, if you have two isomorphic vector bundles, 
uh, then they admit the same Stiefel Whitney classes. Uh, so Stiefel Whitney classes are an invariant of vector bundle. Uh, they are not an invariant of topological spaces because they are not defined for topological spaces but for uh, vector bundles. Uh, so this is the um, most important interpretation of Stiefel Whitney classes. If your vector bundle admits a section, an aware vanishing section, then the top Stiefel Whitney class is zero. Um, so, for instance, if you uh, consider the tangent bundle of uh, a manifold, uh, a section is a vector field. So, if you have a nowhere vanishing vector field, the top Stiefel Whitney class of the tangent bundle must be zero. And uh, more generally, uh, if you have k independent sections, then the top d classes are zero. Okay, and we also we can infer also some uh, topological uh, information. For instance, um, if we consider the tangent bundle of a manifold, uh, then your manifold is orientable if and only if the first Stiefel Whitney class of its tangent bundle is zero. So you can uh, read the orientability of your manifold just by looking at um, the, the first Stiefel Whitney class. And for those who like uh, physics, uh, your manifold admits a spin structure. Uh, this is equivalent to the first two Stiefel Whitney classes of the tangent bundle being zero. Okay. Uh, so this is interesting to, to estimate. Um, and in order to go a bit further in the theory, we have to talk about uh, Grassmann manifolds. Um, sorry, I have a question. Of course. Uh, um, it's just about the numbering because you say first uh, Stiefel Whitney class, but yeah. then it's uh, WD, and, and uh, I'm just confused about uh, how you say first and then. But yeah. then the, the, the so I, I, um, W0, I will call it the zeroth uh, Stiefel Whitney class, W1, the first Stiefel Whitney class, and so on, and WD, I will call it the top Stiefel Whitney class. Ah, okay. So, so, so then uh, um, a vector bundle admits a nowhere vanishing section when the top uh, Stiefel Whitney class vanishes. That's it. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thanks. Okay. Um, so, Grassmann manifold uh, depends on two parameters, D and N. Um, I call it so the Grassmannian GD of Rn. Uh, as a set, this is a set of uh, d-dimensional uh, linear subspaces of Rn. Um, and this set can be endowed with uh, a topology and a smooth manifold structure. And it happens to be of dimension d uh, times n minus d. Uh, for instance, uh, g1 of R2. So this is a set of lines of the plane. And it happens to be a, a circle. Uh, G1 of R3, the set of lines of the space, uh, it looks like that, it's a surface, and it, it is actually um, uh, homomorphic to G2 of R3, the set of planes in the, in the space. Uh, so let me show you how we can um, build uh, G1 of R2. So if you have a, a line in the, in the plane, so uh, you could, you could look, uh, look at its angle. Uh, so put the, the unit uh, circle on the plane. A line intersects the circle at two points, two uh, opposite, two antipodal points. So the Grassmannian G1 of R2 uh, actually is the unit circle where you identify uh, antipodal points. And um, when you take the circle and you identify antipodal points, uh, well, you, you end up with a circle again. But, so basically it goes from zero to pi, while the first circle uh, goes from zero to, to pi. We will also need the infinite Grassmannian, so uh, R infinite uh, will denote the space of sequences of uh, real numbers that are zero uh, from some point. Uh, R infinite is a um, space of polynomials with one 
in the terminate. And we can define just as before the infinite Grassmannian GD of R infinite. Um, and uh, something great happens. The cohomology over Z2 of this space is actually uh, really easy to describe. Uh, it is a free algebra uh, generated by D elements. Um, and each of them, each Wi, has a degree i in the grading of the cohomology. Um, and moreover, uh, this element does not uh, have any polynomial uh, relationship between them. Um, so if you take d equals to 1, uh, g1 of r infinite, so this is a set of um, lines in r infinite, uh, its uh, cohomology algebra is uh, the polynomial ring with one uh, indeterminate. Um, so uh, just to be clear, um, when I say wi has degree i, it means that wi uh, is an element of the ith cohomology group of uh, GD of R infinite. The last uh, remark we need, we can embed the Grassmann manifold into the metric space. So if uh, MRN denotes the space of n times n matrices, um, consider the application that maps uh, any point of the Grassmannian, any, any subspace of Rn, uh, onto the orthogonal projection matrix onto this uh, subspace. Uh, this map is an embedding. Uh, hence, we can, uh, we can uh, see <coughs> the Grassmannian as a submanifold of the metric space. OK, and now we have um, Grassmann manifolds. I can um, uh, tell you about uh, this correspondence that we have between vector bundles and classifying maps. So, um, OK. Uh, so suppose that we have a topological space x and uh, a map xi from uh, x to the Grassmannian, GD of Rn. We can uh, deduce we can build from this map a vector bundle structure on X. So basically, we just uh, pull back the spaces of the Grassmannian on top of, of, of X. Um, and the converse is also true. If you have a vector bundle, uh, as we've seen before, uh, there exists a, a map, Xi, that goes from X to the infinite Grassmannian uh, that will correspond to uh, this, this pullback. Um, and this map is called a, a classifying map. Um, what is nice for us in, in, in practice is that if X uh, is compact, this classifying map can be chosen to go into uh, the Grassmannian GD of RM for M large enough. Okay, so uh, an example, um, the normal bundle of the circle, the map size that, that corresponds to it, uh, one of them, uh, is the following. So uh, G1 of R2 goes from 0 to pi. It is a set of lines of the plane. And you can uh, so map the first uh, line here to 0, because it has angle 0. Then you go around the circle. Here you have an angle of uh, pi over 2. So you go here, and then uh, 0 again. So this map psi um, winds around the Grassmannian two times. Okay, And this is a map that uh, totally describes the vector bundle. So this will be our new definition of uh, vector bundles from now on. Um, we'll say that a vector bundle over uh, a topological space X is a continuous map from X to the Grassmannian. Uh, in practice, it will be uh, uh, to GD of RM. OK, this is a. Uh, most important slide. Now we can define, we can build the, the stiefel whitney classes. So say we have a vector bundle uh, Xi, so it's a map that goes from X to GD of R infinite. Uh, consider Xi star, the map induced in cohomology. So it goes from the cohomology of the Grassmannian to the cohomology of X. 
um, the cohomology of the Grassmannian is this algebra. And we can define the Stiefel Whitney classes as the images of these classes of the Grassmannian into the cohomology of X. W0 of Xi, the zero uh, Stiefel Whitney class, is Xi star of W0. W0, uh, it's, uh, sorry, it's a unit in um, this uh, algebra. W1 of Xi will be Xi star of uh, W1, the class of the Grassmannian, and, and so on. Um, so, still an example with the uh, with so-called. Uh, we've seen that a map Xi that, that describes uh, the normal bundle is a map that winds two times around the Grassmannian. And uh, a map that winds two times in cohomology uh, is, the, is zero because we are uh, over Z2. So um, take W1, the first uh, cohomology class of the Grassmannian, its image by Xi star is zero. So the first Stiefel Whitney class of the normal bundle of the circle is zero. Now take the Mobius strip. Uh, the map Xi that describes this bundle winds uh, only one time around the, the circle of the Grassmannian. So the map induced in cohomology is the, the identity. And so W1 here is sent to something which is non zero. The first Stiefel Whitney class of the Mobius strip uh, is non zero. Okay, um, this is it for Stiefel Whitney classes. If you have any question, do not hesitate. Um, so, Stiefel Whitney classes are uh, interesting to estimate. And I would like to propose a way to um, estimate them from, from uh, pan clouds. So, we, we need uh, a sampling model for vector bundles. Um, so we say that we sample a vector bundle if we observe a pan cloud X, as usual, and a vector bundle structure, a map Xi from X to the Grassmannian. For instance, here, this uh, <coughs> observation, I put some lines over each point of X. Um, so let's do persistent homology. We could consider the check filtration of X, Xt. Um, and we like to endow the thickenings of X with a vector bundle structure. So we like to define uh, extended maps, xi t, that will go from the thickening of X to the Grassmannian. Uh, unfortunately, uh, I didn't find any interesting way to, to um, define these maps. You could try to, so you take a point of the thickening, you could try to project this point onto X, but this is not really well defined. Um, we shall adopt a, a another uh, point of view here. Um, observing a point cloud and a map uh, from this point cloud to the Grassmannian, this is equivalent to observing a point cloud that is a subset of Rn times the Grassmannian. So you can go from this definition to this one by considering the set uh, X check uh, to be the set of pairs, one point of X, and the corresponding uh, subspace, the corresponding point in the Grassmannian. Um, okay, now it goes in uh, three steps. First, embed. Uh, the Grassmannian into the metric space, as we've seen before, via the uh, orthogonal projection matrix. Um, so if you embed the Grassmannian into the metric space, you can say that your point cloud uh, X check is a subset of the product of Rn and the metric space. So this is a nice uh, vector space. We can choose a, a norm, a, a metric on it, for instance, the Euclidean norm, and you can consider the check filtration of X check in the product uh, space. And in this space, 
uh, we can easily define uh, extended maps, xi t. So we, we can endow the thickenings of x check uh, with a vector bundle structure. Take a point x a of your uh, thickening. So x is a point um, in Rn and a uh, is a matrix. You project the matrix A onto the Grassmannian, uh, seen as a subset of the matrix space. Um, OK, so this is uh, what I call the uh, check bundle filtration of X check. The check bundle filtration is the check filtration of X check plus uh, these maps, xi t. Uh, that gives the thickenings a vector bundle structure. And now we can define uh, persistent Stifler Whitney classes. Uh, so we have X check, a subset of uh, Rn times the Grassmannian. It's a check bundle filtration. Uh, so pick uh, an integer. Um, for every uh, thickening of uh, the set X check, we have a Stiefel Whitney class uh, because the maps xi t, so it goes um, into GD of RM. And let me recall you that the ith Stiefel Whitney class um, can be built as the image of wi, the cohomology uh, class in the Grassmannian, by the map xi t star, the map induced in cohomology. Okay, and um, so we say that the ith uh, persistent Stiefel Whitney class of X check is the collection of all the Stiefel Whitney classes of its uh, thickenings. Uh, I lied a bit because these maps, xi t, are uh, not uh, well defined. Um, so I'll tell you that. Xi t, so you, you take a point of the thickening and you project the matrix component into the Grassmannian. Um, but if you want to project a matrix uh, on the Grassmannian, you have to make sure that the matrix uh, is not included in the medial axis of the Grassmannian. The medial axis is a set of points where uh, projection is not well defined. So um, you have to be careful to not uh, go uh, too close to the immediate axis of the Grassmannian, so actually there is uh, a maximal value. Excuse me, Raphael, can I just ask you a question? Of course. On the definition. So um, I don't understand what is the matrix uh, A uh, of XT in the definition of, um, of uh, Xi T. So you take a point X of your church of your thickening of X, but yeah. how do you define uh, A? So uh, X check is a subset of uh, Rn times. Uh, okay, so it's already and so okay, okay, sorry, sorry, I missed it. Uh, okay, 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 so that's fine. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, so yeah, the, the thickening X check is already a subset of Rn times the metric space. Um, and so, um, as I said, we have to make sure that A is not in the medial axis of the Grassmannian. Uh, so there exists uh, actually a maximal value of t such that um, the map xi t are well defined. Um, fortunately, we are able uh, to compute uh, this value uh, t max um, uh, because thanks to this lemma, um, we know the distance from uh, any matrix to the medial axis of the Grassmannian. Uh, so that's how it is. Uh, persistent Stiefel Whitney classes are defined until some uh, value. Okay. Um, in order to um, summarize uh, the information given by uh, persistent Stiefel Whitney class, um, I propose this. Um, uh, construction, uh, the life bar. So let uh, us denote uh, wi of x check the ith persistent Stiefel Whitney class of, uh, of a subset. 
um, the life bar is a set of values of t such that the i-th persistent stiefel witney class at time t is non-zero. Um, so it is a subset of the interval zero t max. And it happens that um, this set is uh, a bar, is an interval. That means that if your uh, stiefel witney class is zero at uh, is non-zero at some point in the filtration, it will be non-zero until the end of the filtration. Um, sorry, I have another question about yeah. the uh, medial axis. Yeah. So, uh, is this uh, dependent on the uh, on the vector bundle that you're taking, or something inherently for the Grassmannian? Um, so, the, um, so you have you have X check. Um, um, so if X check is a subset of Rn times the Grassmannian, yeah. the distance from X check uh, to the medial axis of the Grassmannian uh, does not depend on the vector bundle because um, <coughs> the Grassmannian, um, the distance from any point of the Grassmannian to its medial axis is constant. Okay. Uh, uh, my, my question is if the medial axis itself is that something that exists in the, in the Grassmannian without any further information? Uh, so, the, so the middle axis of the Grassmannian is uh, a subset of the matrix space, and it does not depend on, on your initial uh, vector bundle. It only depends on the Grassmannian. Is that your question? Um. Yes. Uh, yeah. Okay, okay. Yeah. Yeah. I understand now. Yeah. Okay. Sure. I thought the medial axis lies in the Grassmannian, but that's not the case. No, no, no. no. You have okay, to okay. see the Grassmannian as a subset of the whole metric space. Um, okay, so, okay. for example, if if um, uh, you take G one of R two, so uh, I've shown you that it's a circle. Uh, so what is funny actually, uh, G one of R two in the metric space is like a circle, a real circle in, in, a, in a plane. Yeah. So its middle axis is a point in the center of the circle. Uh, okay. Okay. Yeah, makes sense. Thanks. Thank you. Okay, so we were um, uh, dealing with uh, life bars. Uh, the life bar is the set of values of t such that the Schiffer Whitney class is non zero. Uh, I give two uh, simple examples. Uh, here I consider the. So I, I cannot represent the set X check. X check uh, is a subset of a high dimensional space. Um, so I just represent uh, X and the vector spaces above it. And if you uh, compute the persistent Schiffer Whitney class of the normal bundle of the circle, the unit circle in the plane. Uh, its life bar looks like that. It is the empty set. So the stiefel whitney class, the persistent stiefel whitney class of the normal bundle of the circle is uh, zero uh, all along the filtration. Um, the life bar for the Mobius strip is non-zero all along the filtration. Okay. So this is consistent with, with what we've seen before. Um, <clears throat> okay. So we have uh, some results about that. Uh, the first result is a stability result. Um, if you have two subsets, uh, X check and Y check of the product space, Rn times the matrix space, uh, suppose that they are closed in Osdorf distance, then their persistent stiefel whitney classes are also closed. Um, I mean that their life bars are, are closed. Uh, so for instance, this uh, set is a noisy sample of the normal model of the circle. I compute the life bar of the first uh, persistent Stiefel whitney class, and it is the same life bar as if we were observing the exact vector bundle. Um, 
this one is a noisy sample of the uh, Mobius strip. And you can see that the corresponding live bar is close to the original uh, live bar. Okay, we also have a consistency result. Um, uh, so basically, um, as for persistent homology, if your uh, observation is close enough to uh, uh, a vector bundle on a submanifold, uh, there exists a whole interval of, of the filtration where the persistent Stiefel-Whitney class uh, actually is equal to the Stiefel-Whitney class of the underlying vector bundle. Uh, so these are two experiments. Um, I took a sample of the normal bundle of the torus and the normal bundle of the Klein bottle. Uh, the first live bar is the empty set, and the second one is uh, non-zero, is non-empty. Uh, so if I were to um, interpret uh, the um, live bars, I would say that the first uh, observation is sampled near to an orientable uh, vector bundle, um, while the other one is sampled near to a uh, non-orientable vector bundle. Okay, um, so I have to say that this, these two results um, that I call theorem uh, actually are uh, straightforward uh, consequences of the, the definition. It really was a matter of um, finding the right uh, definition. Um, what is a bit more tricky though is what we're going to discuss now, uh, algorithms. So I want to be able to compute these live bars in, in practice. Um, so if you're interested, there is a, a notebook, a Python notebook on my webpage where I, I coded all of that. Let's go. So <clears throat> we have uh, XCheck, a subset of Rn uh, times the metric space. Uh, or Rn times the grass companion. Uh, we consider its check bundle filtration. Uh, so the check filtration of itself and the extended maps. And we consider its i-th uh, persistent stiefel whitney class. So it, it goes like that. Uh, every map xi t goes from the t thickening of x check to the grass companion. We have a, a map induced in cohomology that goes from the cohomology of the Grassmannian into the cohomology of uh, X check T. And the stiefel whitney class at time T is the image of the class WI of the Grassmannian. And we want to uh, compute this stiefel whitney class uh, with the computer. So of course, we will use uh, simply short methods. We need a triangulation of uh, my teeth thickening and a triangulation of the Grassmannian. Uh, triangulating the thickening, it's, it's easy. Uh, we know how to do that. You, it's just a union of bold. So you take the nerve um, and you obtain something which is homotopically equivalent to your uh, thickening. Uh, triangulated the Grassmannian. Uh, so this is a problem in itself. Um, and I will show you how to do that in, in a few slides. So suppose that we have these triangulations. Um, <clears throat> I denote the topological realization of the triangulations, uh, st between two bars and g between two bars. So the topological realization is the topological space that corresponds to a simply short complex. Um, and we have, um, homomorphisms between um, topological realizations of simply short complexes and the space they triangulate. So we can, uh, this map, xi t, uh, can be pulled back uh, between the simply short complexes, between their topological realizations. Um, and we would like to uh, translate this map in the world of simply short complexes. We would like to find a map between the simply short complex ST and G that will correspond to uh, this map here, this uh, vector bundle structure. Uh, so this is a problem that is called a simply short approximation. This is well known in, in algebraic topology. And what we can use 
uh, is the store condition. Um, <clears throat> so this map G uh, that is defined as uh, these arrows like that, uh, we say that it satisfies the store condition if uh, the following is true. Uh, for every vertex of the first simplicial complex, uh, there must exist a vertex of the second simplicial complex such that, uh, so you take the closed star of the first vertex, you take its image by G, and you want this image to be a subset of the open star of the second uh, vertex. Uh, so for instance, if ST were uh, this uh, simple simplicial complex and G were this one, uh, consider the map G uh, like that. I, I draw the image of uh, ST. Um, so pick a vertex S, uh, V, for instance, this one, its uh, closed star is uh, in red. It's like the neighborhood for simplicial complexes. Um, the image of its closed star is here in red. And if I pick the vertex W here, uh, its uh, open star is in purple. And you can see that its open star contains uh, the image in red. So the map G satisfies the star condition um, for the vertex B. And the map G satisfies the star condition if it does for every vertex. When it does, um, we can uh, define a simplicial approximation. So uh, for every vertex V, choose a corresponding vertex W and call this vertex uh, F of V. Uh, what you end up with is a map from uh, the vertex set of ST to the vertex set of G. It is a simplicial map. And moreover, uh, its uh, topological realization uh, here is a homotopic equivalent to G. So we have been able to um, transform the map G into a simplicial map F that, that corresponds to it. Yeah, a remark. Um, if uh, G does not satisfy the star condition, there always uh, exists a way to ensure that it does. Uh, it consists in uh, subdivising the initial simplicial complex. So it is called a uh, barycentric subdivision. Um, it is a way of refining your simplicial complex. And you, if you refine it enough, uh, G will satisfy the star condition at some point. Uh, and this is something we can do easily in practice. Uh, okay, there is a small uh, problem. Um, uh, uh, checking whether G satisfies the store condition is not something we can do in practice. Because uh, we have to ensure that the image of the closed star is a subset of the open star, but the closed star is an infinite uh, set. And we cannot ver uh, certify that each point of this infinite set belongs to another set. set. Uh, so I propose uh, something uh, close, uh, but usable in practice, uh, the weak star condition. So basically, uh, instead of uh, looking at the whole image of the closed star, you only look at the vertices of the image of the closed star. And you are just looking for a, a vertex such that the vertices of the image of the closed star are included in the open star. This is something that we can do in practice. Um, and just as for the star condition, we can define a weak simplicial approximation. Um, and so a weak simplicial approximation is uh, a simplicial map. Uh, however, it may not be uh, equivalent, it may not be uh, a simplicial approximation. Uh, though, if the initial simplicial complex is uh, subdivised enough, the weak simplicial approximations and the simplicial approximations uh, are equivalent notions. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so, this is it for simplicial approximations. 
uh, I've told you that we have to triangulate the grass Mayan. Uh, so uh, this is something which uh, can be done in theory because the grass manifolds are uh, triangulable. This is because uh, they admit a, a simple CW structure, uh, but uh, wasn't able to, to, to find uh, in practice such a triangulation. Uh, what I know um, how to do is to triangulate the grass manian when D is equal to one. Uh, and in this case, these spaces are called the projective spaces. So G1 of Rn, so this is a set of lines of Rn, uh, and you can triangulate it very easily. Uh, take the antiplex and remove the interior, uh, subdivide it, and then identify the antipodal points. Um, that gives you a triangulation of G1 of Rn. So, well, so uh, yeah, I'm sorry, but we will only uh, stay with D equals to one um, from now on. Um, by the way, uh, D equals to one means that we consider vector bundle of dimension one. So there is only one uh, Stiefel Whitney class that is interesting, W1, because the second Stiefel Whitney class will be zero and, and the other one also. Um, so our problem now is um, <coughs> to compute the first Stiefel Whitney class of. Uh, um, uh, one-dimensional vector bundle. Um, so this is an easier problem than for general vector bundles. The um, cohomology of the Grassmannian uh, in degree one, so it is a cyclic group. Um, you only have one class that generates the, the group. Uh, so we have to find the image uh, of Xiety star. Okay, the uh, first Stiefel Whitney class uh, is the image of uh, the class WI, W1. Uh, so you can do uh, like that. So you find a triangulation of your uh, thickening, you find a triangulation of the Grassmannian, then um, you check if uh, Xite satisfies the weak star condition. If it does not, uh, subdivide your simplicial complex until Xite satisfies the star condition. When it does, uh, find a weak simplicial approximation, and then you're, you're done. You, ha you have a, a simplicial map that uh, gives you, uh, in simplicial uh, cohomology, the Stiefel Whitney class. Okay, uh, this is almost the end. A last uh, comment. Uh, so this is a bit um, deceiving because we are able to compute the Stiefel Whitney class, the persistent Stiefel class, when t is fixed. Uh, but we would like to adopt a persistent point of view on that. We'd like to compute the life bar of the persistent Stiefel Whitney class. Um, <clears throat> so there are uh, three possibilities to do that. Um, so we want to find the values of t such that w1 of psi t is non zero. You can either uh, compute, as we've seen before, W1 of Xi T for uh, many values of T, and then you check uh, if they are zero or not. Um, uh, you could use uh, the algorithm that exists for the image, the persistence of uh, an image. Uh, but in this case, there is a simple formula that we can uh, use. Um, so let me show it to you. Uh, it is based on, on mapping cones. So um, <clears throat> the mapping cone is a uh, well-known uh, construction in algebraic topology that allows to uh, transform a map between topological spaces into a topological space. So the mapping cone is a topological space, C of xi t, that contains all the information of the map xi t. And uh, the mapping cone comes with uh, a long exact sequence that uh, connects um, the homology, the cohomology of the mapping cone and of the two spaces here. And we can simply deduce a, a formula like that. The rank of uh, Xi T star, the map inducing cohomology, 
is given by this uh, infinite sum, uh, which is actually finite. Uh, and, and this can be uh, computed in, in practice uh, with a simple persistent algorithm. Okay, so uh, that's it. So um, <clears throat> a comment about perspectives. So I, I talk about Stiefel Whitney classes, but um, Stiefel Whitney classes are an instance of a more general theory uh, that is called uh, characteristic classes. And I think that these ideas uh, could be also used for these uh, more general uh, characteristic classes. And uh, yeah, as you've seen, uh, the limitation of the algorithm is that uh, I don't have access to a triangulation, a general triangulation of the Grassmannian. So if you have any ideas about that, I would be very happy. And yeah, that's it. Thanks you. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Raphael. Um, we have time for a couple of questions. So if you have any, please. Can I ask one? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was just wondering, so is it, did I understand this right, that we need a metric on the Grassmannians? Um, so what, what you need is a metric on the product mm. of uh, Rn times the metric space. Yep. Um, What's the normal metric on that? Like, is that something, is it easy to put a metric on the Grassmannian part of that product or? So, yeah, so I, um, I use a, simp uh, a very simple solution. I just took the metric on the metric space. Yeah. And I used the uh, induced metric on the Grassmannian. Yeah, for sure. Which Do you is just a, think of it as like a subset of R n times n or whatever? Sorry? You, you think of it as a subset of like R n yeah. times n? Yeah, that's it. Yeah, okay. yeah. You could use a, like a, you can endo um, the Grassmannian with a Riemannian structure and you look at like just these distances, but it's not very important here. Okay, cool. Um, also, I just want to ask, so at the, your input data for this is a point cloud and also a map from the point cloud to the Grassmannians, right? Mm. So what's like, in what applications do you normally have that map at the start? Or like, what would, did you have in mind with that? Yeah, so exactly this slide. So what's that map usually in app applications? Mm. So yeah, this is a good question. Um, at the beginning, I was um, thinking about, um, like when you observe uh, uh, cars, um, see, you, you observe uh, cars uh, yep. on, on roads. Yep. So you, if you have a GPS, you can uh, uh, obtain the spatial information yep. of your car and the direction. Oh, so like the tangent of like yeah. some measured tangent in real world data. Yeah, yeah. So, oh, the, cool. so this could be like a, a cars uh, expanding from a center point or something yeah. like that. Yeah. Do you know anyone who's tried something like that? Um, or, uh, yeah, I've I've seen one paper or two where where they uh, analyze uh, uh, like vector bundles on clouds of dimension yeah. one. Um, Oh, awesome. Any other question in the... Uh, yes, so I have two questions. <clears throat> the first one is, uh, you said that it's easy to compute the cone of a map on a computer, but how do you do it? <laughs> um, <laughs> um, so, the cone... Um, <clears throat> because so I know the definition, but uh, like, yeah, yeah. Uh, it's not clear how you can put, how you can Computer quotient on a, a quotient space on your computer. Oh, it's it's actually really easy. So the cone uh, is based on the mapping cylinder. Uh, yeah. If so, yeah, you take your space x and your space y and you connect them. So this can be done with a simplicial approximation. Yeah. And, and then to obtain a cone, you just add a point. Yeah. And you connect this point to each point of the first space. Yeah, yeah, but like you don't have no issue. I mean, it's. There is like zero issue. Question spaces are easy to compute when you have like two simplicial models. Yeah, okay, yeah. yeah, yeah. No, in general, questions are hard to deal with uh, in simplicial yeah. topology, but in this case, it's just you, you add a point and connect this point to your space. So you basically you, you took all the simplicities of the first simplicial complex and you yeah. add you add a point. Yeah. Okay, okay, maybe. I, I trust you on this one. And, uh, also, my second question was, what about uh, more general filtrations? Because you're just looking at uh, uh, 
uh, check uh, filtration, but what about, for instance, you know, just imag uh, imagine you have like a, just, you know, a very general filtration of a space mm -hmm. and uh, you would like to, do you think that your construction could extend to, if you have just like a, a sequence of nested, double, uh, nested let's say, a sub manifold mm -hmm. of, um, of RN and you have like a, uh, tangent bundle, uh, like a vector model uh, on them. Do you think like your your definition could extend to? Yeah, yeah, of course. Uh, uh, in the pre print I wrote, um, I um, explained the theory for uh, vector bundle filtrations in general. Okay. Uh, but it, this would have been a bit of uh, theoretical nonsense to present it to you. Uh, like, oh, okay, no, it was okay. just uh, was just a question. But, but yeah, we can define just. Uh, uh, you can define bundle filtrations. Uh, they are uh, like filtration with a vector bundle structure. Okay. Uh, yeah. It's on your archive uh, paper or is it just? Yes, it's yes. on okay. my web page and on archive. Okay, I should have looked at it, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> uh, any other question? I had maybe two questions, I guess. Um, first question is related to the question about how to get the Grassmannian. Would it be possible to count to guess um, the vector bundle from the data point set, assuming that it's like a manifold? Yeah, yeah. Uh, okay. Totally. This is uh, this is uh, something I, I did last year. Um, if you have a, a sample of uh, some manifold, you could try to estimate its uh, tangent bundle or its uh, normal bundle. Um, okay. Yeah, and then you and the other it. question I had, sorry, I don't know. Go ahead. The other question I had was not very, it's not related to the Stiefel Whitney classes, but you said that there was other work on persistent cohomology. Mm. And do you have the names of such references? Um, so in the um, algorithmic uh, parts, I've seen a paper like a persistent cup product of someone named Yarmola or something like that um, for the algorithms. And um, <clears throat> so I can uh, ask the help of uh, Nicolas Bercouk for, for the theoretical part. Um, so I think people like Gino um, try to study the algebraic structure of uh, persistent cohomology algebra. Is that right? Yeah, so basically, there is a paper by uh, Joanne Leray and uh, Gregory Gino about uh, basically, yeah, so looking at the, at the algebraic structure, structure you get uh, when you look at uh, persistent algebras, basically, not just persistent uh, vector spaces, okay, which is the usual context of persistent homology. And basically, to do so, if you want to understand precisely what happens, you need to get into some way more complicated uh, algebraic world, which is namely the A infinity algebra structure. Okay. If you know it. And so basically in this paper, they just look at, they just define properly. There is, it's not, it's definitely not an application paper, but it's really just states the definition that one should, uh, uh, introduce if you want really to, to, to study this and uh, as a consequence they can define for instance uh, an A infinity interleaving distance between persistent algebras and uh, stuff like this but I need to I just know the paper from outside I, uh, I need to look at it more precisely but uh, okay defined there thank you <laughs>